My name is Stuart Factor. I'm a neurologist at Emory University, and it's my great pleasure today to be interviewing for the oral histories Dr. Daniel Tarsi. Dr. Tarsi is professor of neurology at Harvard University and is the vice chair of neurology at Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital. So, uh, Dan, why don't we start from the beginning? Maybe you could um, tell us a little bit about your early years, how you became interested in movement disorders, and who were the key people in your life that really enhanced your career? Sure, my pleasure to do that. And I firstly want to begin just by thanking the Movement Disorder Society for inviting me to do this. It's really a, an incredible honor. I know lots of well-known people have gone before me and will follow in the future, so it's nice to be part of that group. Um, I went to, uh, I'm from New York, I went to Cornell University for undergraduate, and I would say uh, important experience I had there, I was a major in psychology. Wasn't quite sure what I was going to do with it. I actually spent most of my time running rats through mazes. Uh, I actually spent an entire spring break one year running through rats through mazes, and I think that was the thing that made me say, no, this is not what I want to be doing. Uh, I then took a course in biological psychology, and a professor, Kurt Goldstein, I remember him very, very well, was very inspirational. He, he was very interested in neurotransmitters and their impact more on psychiatry than neurology at that time, and serotonin was the big player. And I don't know if you remember, Timothy Leary was a Harvard professor who was still rather respectable at that point, uh, who was looking at uh, the effects of LSD and then started sampling it on his own. Uh, and so this was in the 1960s when yes all this, was happening. this was in the, I was this was in the mid early to mid 60s and uh, there was also a book written by somebody else can't remember who it was and I, I read part of it it was called the chemistry of the mind and I thought that was really incredible that you could sort of understand the brain by virtue of transmitters and chemicals and I said I think this is what I want to do but thinking what I what really, how do I get there, I said, I think I want to be a neurologist. And I didn't really know exactly what a neurologist was, but I thought I knew. Became pre-med, because I was not pre-med, and uh, wound up going to uh, New York University School of Medicine a couple of years later. Uh, and then I, I started meeting people that were influential. The chairman of neurology at, at NYU, uh, Clark Rant, not very well known nationally, but a, a very brilliant neurologist. He, he was a wonderful person to present cases to. He was very knowledgeable. His rounds were terrific. And he once called me into his office somewhere halfway through and said, I heard you're interested in going into neurology. I said, I am. And he said, well, what do you think you want to do? I said, well, I don't know for sure. Uh, something in neurology. And he said, well, let me give you one piece of unsolicited advice. And he said, you know, I was in private practice for a year uh, before I decided to go academic, and I found it, and the word, I'll never forget the word he used, I, I found it a deadening experience. Um, he felt that it was just, it bored him. Uh, he wasn't seeing interesting cases of the type he thought he would. He was seeing patients with headaches and dizziness and low back pain, and he said, uh, you really don't want to do that full time. You're going to have to see patients, but you may want to be a little more selective and I think that was influential. And then the other person in medical school was I took an elective for six months with Morris Bender at Mount Sinai Hospital, <coughs> which was just up the road from NYU. And I got the exposure to somebody who was also very brilliant, um, but combined basic neuroscience research. He was interested in the oculomotor system, as you may remember, eye movements. Uh, but he also had a vast clinical practice at any given time in the hospital at Mount Sinai, um, he would have as many as 50 or 60 inpatients of his own that would be presented dutifully by the chief resident, and he would opine about them and record. He was so interested in phenomenology, he's famous for that, and he was interested in raw data. So if someone said something, he would capture it on a microphone, and then his secretary was obliged to put that into the admitting note. So that he wanted raw data. He, he despised secondhand information. He wouldn't believe anything residents would say when they present. So where did you get that from? Is this from the patient or did you put this in there? Uh, he also, the other thing he taught me was he said he didn't allow residents below the level of chief to um, quote the literature. So if the worst thing you could do, and usually the younger people were warned about this, 
was say, oh, I read this article about systemic lupus and its neurologic complications. And he, and he said, you don't need to read that. Just come here, tell us what you know based on your patient. And then I'll tell you what I know based on 50 patients I have that I haven't written up. Um, so he had a vast clinical, and that combination of being in the lab and clinical was pretty impressive. Um, he was a, an influential guy for students and residents. We were talking earlier yeah. about his pedigree of family members. Yes. All went into neurology after, yeah. after him. So well, His nephew um, was a, is a good, still a good friend of mine, and he was a co-resident with me when I went to Boston University a couple of years later. Um, so I didn't, I, the, um, the next step was I did two years of medicine in Baltimore. And while I was there, Which hospital were you? Uh, I was at a combination of Hopkins and Baltimore. It was called Baltimore City Hospitals at that time. I liked the city hospital environment. I was exposed to Bellevue. I liked being the one taking care of patients on the front lines, the crazy emergency room experience. And so Baltimore City Hospitals attracted me. And um, it's now called Har uh, Johns Hopkins Bayview Medical Center, I think mm -hmm. is the name it's been morphed to. And uh, the chairman of medicine there, Julius Crevens, was pretty influential too. He didn't know anything about neurology. Well, he knew a little bit about neurology, but um, he was just a phenomenal medical clinician uh, as well as a researcher, and that impressed me a lot, just looking for people that maybe emulate someday if I'd be lucky enough. I also did some research as a medical first-year resident, a couple of things. One is I did a spinal fluid study on stroke patients measuring CPK and the spinal fluid, which had been done, but I thought it was kind of neat. I was looking for objective measures of something. And then I spent a month, I had a month elective as, as, a, as a first year resident with uh, Dr. Johns. I'm blocking on his first name, but he was very well known in my, he was a internist, but his interest was mainly in myasthenia gravis. And uh, also he was very, uh, he had written a lot about Lambert-Eaton syndrome. And I did a project with him, didn't lead anywhere. The spinal fluid study never got published. The, the study I did with him did, but, but it was a great experience. Uh, I also worked with a guy named Julian Chisholm, who was an expert in uh, acute intermittent porphyria and its neurologic effect. So there was a lot, Hopkins was a great source. And, uh, and then I got out of there and I spent two years in the Army. It was during the Vietnam era. Uh, and during those two years, I spent uh, one year in Vietnam in my, my uh, second year of that two years. Didn't do much neurology there. I was a general medical officer and patched up folks that came in after they got shot up and uh, then d and did sick call, treating mostly venereal disease, actually, <laughs> and a little bit of malaria. <laughs> Didn't see much neurology there. I guess. No, no. I learned how to put in a chest tube, never done it as an intern or a resident because uh, I didn't do surgery, and uh, I was taught by a medic how to put in a chest tube, and uh, I was able to do that. Uh, I came back from Boston, and I had already arranged to do my residency at uh, Boston University School of Medicine. Their major teaching hospital at the time, besides the university hospital, was a VA hospital, um, which I liked, because again, it was sort of like a city hospital environment. You know, the residents really took care of the patients. Um, and my, one of the first patients I inherited when I went on the ward, July 1, having just come back from, uh, from uh, Vietnam, it was a patient with tardive dyskinesia. And uh, I had a very charismatic resident, uh, first my senior resident, my senior resident over me. And he said, I want you to see this. And he was an incredibly thoughtful guy. Mike Holden was his name. He's since passed away. And Mike said, pay attention to this. And, and this was in the early days of tardive dyskinesia. It was 1973, and people didn't even know what it was and had no ideas about mechanisms. And he said, take a look at this guy and think about it. And he, remember the quote. He said, this is a window into the brain. Because he thought that a, a drug-induced movement disorder might have mechanisms that would lead you to understand spontaneous movement disorders. So I think that was the first direction, and, and tardive dyskinesia became a... a almost an obsession with me for the first few years, wrote a lot of papers, did some research. Uh, so that was very, very helpful. And then the other thing was in 1969, a year before I started, Levodopa was released. It was called, the trade name was Laradopa and Dopar. 
and it was levodopa raw, no carbidopa. So we gave grams of the stuff. And I saw a little bit of what, like, what Oliver Sacks had popularized when he wrote the book Awakenings of people walking that hadn't walked in a number of years. We even had a few post-encephalytics on the ward who had been inpatients for years. And that was incredible. And I said, okay, th there's therapeutics here. I was a little worried about neurology. I had heard there's nothing you can really do for patients. And I said, that doesn't look like that's going to be true. Huge change, leave it open. Yeah. Uh, and other things, in the, that, those, as a resident, I got interested in physostigmine and its effect on dyskinesias in Korea. And I did a little study. Um, I was followed the lead of Harold Klawans. It was, I didn't know well, but it was another very influential guy at the time, because there weren't, you know, there was, Harold Kowans was really one of the first people, at least in the modern era at that time, to have a research interest and trained a lot of people that are still around in the movement disorder society now. And uh, he had done a, a paper with a, a psychiatry resident, actually worked with him, and they injected physostigmine, cholinergic drug, and it suppressed Huntington's chorea, and I think they had given it to some patients with tardive dyskinesia. And it was sort of, it was part of this dopamine acetylcholine balance that everyone was talking about. So I did a study. I actually had trouble duplicating its findings for whatever reason. I did find it, it did, su it did um, suppress uh, tardive dyskinesia, but it had no effect, at least in, we had a lot of HD patients. And I couldn't see any effect on HD. Um, and I presented that at a meeting uh, in 1972. The, there was a 100th anniversary meeting commemorating the first description of Huntington's disease in 1872. Right. And so this thing was published in the book. It was actually the first volume. Do you remember the series mm -hmm. Advances in Neurology? Yeah. Volume 1 had a blue cover. Mm -hmm. So I got into that. You still have it? I still have it. Yeah. Who, um, who did you do that work with? Um, I did it. Oh, good question. Um, Jam that was before you went on your neuropharmacology. Yeah, it was before. I, I think I, one of my co-residents, I think, worked with me on it. Mm -hmm. and, but at the staff level, there was certainly nobody interested in movement disorder. So it was, the chair was Bob Feldman. Mm -hmm. I remember we sat down together, and he was a very good writer, and he went over the manuscript and you know, made changes and things like that. Um, the other thing that happened, at, besides meeting Harold Kluans in Columbus, Ohio, is where the HD meeting was. I, met, I didn't actually meet Stan Fon. I didn't speak with him. I think I was a little... He, he wasn't a big name then. He was still at Penn. Mm -hmm. And I remember him. I don't remember if he gave a talk or presented a paper, but I remember mostly about Stan. is standing in the back of the room with his hands in his pockets, asking brilliant questions, very perceptive questions. And I said, that guy's good. He's going to... He'll be something someday. <laughs> and, you know, a couple of years he went to Columbia and the rest is history. Um, the other thing that influenced me is, is I presented the pfizer stigmine data at the academy a year or two later when I was still a resident. And uh, right after I got off the podium, it was a platform session, a guy named Chaim Naiman, who was a Beth Israel clinical general neurologist, presented two patients. So they were siblings, sisters who had severe dystonia that was remarkably responsive to L-DOPA. And I remember that a lot of people said, what? You know, that, that, that doesn't happen. And we, I've tried it in my patients. That they, what, they had DRD. They had DOPA responsive dystonia, except Hyam didn't know that. Hadn't been described, hadn't been described yet. To, Toby Nygaard, years later at Columbia, started writing lots of papers about it. And uh, so I said, well, whatever they have, they clearly better. This isn't fake. And I said, more therapeutics. So that was, that was a big thing. And then the next stage uh, in those early years was um, I did a, uh, a six-month elective out of my residency. I was fortunate that it allowed you that much consecutive time. And I went across town. I worked with uh, Ross Baldessarini, who was a psychiatrist, but a very biological psychiatrist, um, very good in, in clinical psychiatry. But what he was really interested in was neurotransmitter basis of psychiatric disorders. And uh, he was interested in tardive dyskinesia, too, for the same reasons that Mike Holden, three years earlier, said, look at this. This may be a clue. And um, so they had been doing some experiments with narcotics and tolerance in rats, methadone. 
And they noticed withdrawal symptoms when they were stopped. So actually, this was his idea. I give him credit for this. He suggested that um, we treat rats for a few weeks with neuroleptics. We used Thorazine, Chlorpromazine, and uh, I forgot the other one. We used maybe Prochlorperazine, a couple of potent, and Haloperidol for sure, and then placebo, and then stop it at three weeks and see what happens, and then also expose them to apomorphine in low doses, subtherapeutic doses, or subtoxic doses, because apomorphine in rodents and many animals causes what's called stereotype movements. They, they sniff and they chew the cage, and it's sort of a, maybe an analog to, to dyskinesia in a rat. So sure enough, we showed with dose response curves that they, they were very sensitive to apomorphine-induced stereotypies. And um, that got published in a couple of good journals, including Nature. And um, from that, Ross and I, Ross Baldessarini and I, were called upon to come to meetings, present this, and then write a number of review articles. So I wrote, wrote with Ross several review articles uh, on uh, tardive dyskinesia and what it meant and what, what it was going to lead to. And then at the same time, another great influence on me and how I got to David Marsden was Frank Benson. Frank Benson was an aphasiologist in the BU system. He was Norman Geshwin's um, heir, kind of, in the system, and trained on, he was a general practitioner in Oregon uh, in, in neurology, and he decided to become academic, trained with Norman, and happened the year, my last year as a resident, while I was with Ross Baldessarini, he was in London doing a, a sabbatical, and I had a real urge to spend a year in London. I just loved London. I had been there, and I, I just want to live there for a year, see what it's like. I had a family by then. My, my wife and two of my three sons uh, were around, and uh, so I said, I'd like to go to London. Who's there I should write a letter to? And, and I said quickly, you know, I know about Queen Square. I, I don't know if I want to go to Queen Square. I want to do anything else out there, or should I just apply to Queen Square? And he said, well, there's a young guy here who I've been very impressed with. I've sat with him at rounds, and very smart guy. He's very young. He's in his 30s. Uh, but I think he's got a real future, and it was David Marston. It was just an incredibly fortuitous um, event. So I wrote David a letter, and the first thing he says, I have no money, but come. So I had to scratch money together. So there's another stop along the way of neuropharmacology. There was a fellow at Mass General, Joe Fisher. He was a surgeon, very celebrated surgeon who actually spent time at NIH with Axelrod, Julius Axelrod. He was part of that Axelrod mafia of Baldessarini, him, Fisher himself, uh, Richard Wertman, and a few other notables, and I'm not even remembering names now. And um, he said, well, why don't you, you know, liver disease causes neurologic complications, and people are starting to use L-DOPA, thinking an amino acid would be helpful. So I, at the VA, I was still at the VA, I was, I was at MGH with Ross, but I would go back to the VA at least once a week, and I wrote a protocol. At that time, there was no IRV. So you just wrote a protocol overnight, and you did the study. And so we gave L-DOPA to some patients with uh, hepatic encephalopathy, uh, not with movement disorders. They were just confused. And unfortunately, we didn't gather enough patients, and I was leaving, so we never finished the study. So it was another unpublished study along the way. Did it make them more confused? It, no, it, 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 it maybe made them a little better, but the end was too small and it was underpowered, and so I can't tell you what it showed. Before you go on to David, um, when you were in Boston, you um, had some exposure to Norman Geshwin. What was yeah. he like? And well, he was brilliant. You know, he was from Brooklyn, which is where I'm from. He went to boys' high school in Brooklyn. He was an un most graduates of boy high, not to be. This isn't a negative comment. They usually made their way in the NBA. <laughs> <laughs> and, but uh, he, uh, he went to boys' high school and then Harvard. And he was chair uh, at, um, at Boston City Hospital. And I, I was exposed to him in uh, my rotation through Boston City Hospital as part of the BU network of hospitals. And uh, he would discuss cases that were amazing. He, he had the, uh, oh, his clinical experience was actually somewhat shallow, but very broad. By shallow, I mean we had the impression whenever you'd present a case to him, you could present a muscular case. It didn't have to be higher cortical function. 
he would always begin by saying, I remember when I was chief resident at, or when I went to London, I forgot where he was, I don't know if it was Queen Square or not, it might have been, and I saw this case, and he had epigrammatic cases, and he sort of implied to us, although he never said it, that all you had to do was see one example, and you knew, you knew the universe of cases, so that he was never short of what he could say about anything, even though his experience wasn't, he was the opposite of Morris Bender, who had 50 cases of anything. Mm -hmm. He had one case, that's all you needed. Right or wrong, uh, it was an interesting point of view. The other thing, before getting on to my experience with David, is that Frank Benson, and again, another influence that I already mentioned, pointed me in David Marsden's direction. Frank Benson was writing a book, a collection of articles on psychiatric aspects of neurologic disorders. And he said, I'd like you to explore uh, psych movement disorders in the pre antipsychotic drug area that caused uh, involuntary move or abnormal movements. And he said, have you ever heard of, uh, well, I don't think I remember their names, the, the fathers of schizophrenia research from the 19 teens and 20s? I'm blocking on who these people were and I wrote all about them. But um, was it Kraepelin? I'm not sure. Um, and so I went into the back stacks of Countway Library at Harvard and dug out old articles in which they described chorea, dyskinesia, dystonia, at least it sounded like that, no drug, they certainly didn't have tardive dyskinesia. And uh, they thought it was part of their schizophrenic syndrome and they thought that there were motor aspects to it and they had other names for these things. Uh, so I wrote a review of all of this stuff that I knew nothing about and I had no first-hand experience. And what that was good for was Ross helped me write that, reviewed it, and then I went to, I hadn't finished it, I got to London, and I got there in July, and I spent the summer finishing this review, and it was a hard review because, you know, this was pre-computer, you had to go to the library, dig out these books, photocopy them, and I got David Marsden interested in it, and he said, what are you doing? I said, oh, oh, that's interesting stuff, I know a little bit about it, but he was at the Maudsley too, so there was a whole background of psychiatric neurology where he was working, and in the end, the three of us all wrote that together, and so I was able to interest that, you know, Ross didn't know David, David didn't know Ross. A couple of years later, David visited Boston, and I introduced them, and they, David spent some time rounding over it at, in Ross's place. And uh, so it was a great opportunity to put those, those, t those guys together. And then David, one could talk forever this morning, uh, there was some, uh, in the sessions downstairs at the uh, MDS meeting this week, some reminiscences of everyone who trained with him or knew him has stories to tell. David uh, was a superstar. He, at the age of 34, he became professor. Uh, it was fortuitous because it was a brand new department. They called it the University Department of Neurology. And they built it from scratch and they had to appoint professors. So he was a logical choice. People knew him, knew he was smart and that he had a real future. Uh, he had done his original work, as you know, in neuroanatomy. He was very interested in the, in the melanin-containing substantia nigra. And uh, at, at that time, people barely knew that the nigra was important in Parkinson's disease. It was about the pallidum. Purden Martin had written a book about the globus pallidus and Parkinson's disease. Uh, and that was all wrong, it turned out. And uh, then he did a lot of physiology, and he hadn't done much biochemical pharmacology till he moved to his job, which was a couple of years before I got there, so it was around 1971, something like that. And then he hired Peter Jenner to work with him, and Peter Jenner really drove the neuropharmacology research. But David had this ability to take a clinical question and translate it. Talk about, we didn't call it translational work, and he translated it back the other way. He translated the clinical question and the clinical observation into what you might see in rats and even primates. And Peter Jenner helped with that work. And actually, the, I found out years later at a fest trip for David when they recounted his career, his first paper on biochemical pharmacology. I can't remember right now what it was. It was about five co-authors. I was on the paper, and I looked at the, the slide. I couldn't, didn't even remember that. And I said, that's his first <laughs> paper, and there I am. It's just, just really a great little thing to see. Um, Anyway, I, it was a great fellowship. It was one year.
and packed a lot into it. I, I was in the clinic. I was in a general neurology clinic a half a day a week and a movement disorder clinic a half a day a week and um, had some interesting experiences in the movement disorder clinic. One thing was I, when I got there, they were using a drug called Maxilon, which was metoclopramide. We talked about that earlier. And metoclopramide, I knew enough to know that it caused dystonic reactions like antipsychotics did. But I said, you're giving this to patients with Parkinson's to block the nausea that they're getting from levodopa. Is that rational? I mean, aren't you making them worse? And I said, well, we haven't noticed anything. We don't give them a lot. But they were giving them 10 milligrams three times a day. So I said, okay, we'll do a study. Again, no IRB. I wrote the thing <laughs> quickly. And I compared metoclopramide, uh, a neuroleptic, I think it was Pemazide, I believe, and Phenergan, which is a phenothiazine without motor, comp motor effects. It's a weak dopamine blocker. And in that study, we only it was eight or nine patients, uh, open label. I think it was a crossover design. And they didn't seem to get worse. I published this in the, the English Green Journal and also in a letter to Lancet. And, uh, you know, I was wrong. I missed it. They actually, they should have gotten worse. I don't know why they didn't. And someone came along later and, and sort of reproduced it. I think he gave a little bit higher doses of Professor Bateman, as I recall. And we exchanged letters at the time. And I said, well, you know, I, it should cause Parkinson's to get worse. And apparently it does. And I, I missed that. Well, now we know it does. <laughs> <laughs> now we know it does. A lot of mischief. It's yeah. still going on today with TD, um, tardive dyskinesia as well. Um, so it was a great year, and uh, I was in the lab. I, fortunately, there was a Chris Pycock, who I spent most of my time with in the lab, uh, was doing a lot of biochemical pharmacology experiments. And so David wanted to ask the clinical questions and translate them into the laboratory and then back out to the clinic. So GABA was becoming a hot item at that time, gamma immunobutyric acid. And its role wasn't clear, so I injected GABA blockers, picrotoxin, into the substantia nigra of rats, which created turning behavior, the rotating rat model, in a way that was consistent with blocking GABA had an influence on generating uh, increased dopaminergic activity that made the rats rotate. We didn't do anything to their dopamine system. We just blocked their GABA system. So clearly GABA, and we know that now, there's a strong influence. And... Um, you did some, did you do, is that where you did the animal work and TD models too, or was that? That, that was, was done, that was with Ross, yeah. and I never replicated that, didn't do that when I got there. I presented that data in London, you know, and to, to David's group, and they thought it was interesting. But uh, we were busy doing other things and moving ahead. I injected, the other thing I did was I injected um, picrotoxin into the caudate nucleus of rats, which was an easy target because the caudate nucleus is huge. And they developed contralateral myoclonus, which another investigator prior to that had done and called it choreiform movements in the rat. And it really wasn't choreiform. It was myoclonic jerks. And that got published in Brain. And the good thing about that was when you go for a one-year fellowship, you need to have someone carry on your work after you leave. Otherwise, you're wasting your time. And so Chris Pycock and, and David and a couple other people carried on some of this work and and then together, transatlantic, again, pre-computer. So we wrote, I don't know how we did this. We wrote a draft and would send it and get it back. Or at least it would fly by plane. I remember the old, in the 19th century, it went by ship. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were able to sort of put this thing, and it was, it was able to get it into brain. So um, that generated a lot of, uh, wrote a lot of papers that year, a lot of them with, with Chris Pycock on uh, Various we manipulated clozapine. You know, why doesn't clozapine act as a typical antipsychotic? And it didn't have the effect of, uh, on animal behavior that the neuroleptics did. We confirmed that. Uh, we looked at cholinergic drugs in the rotating mouse model. Uh, so it was a very fertile area for generating data. Um, so that, that was very profitable. And I came back to BU. You just told me you interacted with Roger Dubois. Oh, yeah. I forgot to mention that. So I walked into David's. He was in a two-story building. And the physiology was on the first floor and the pharmacology on the second floor. And the first person I met was Roger Dubois, who was doing a sabbatical there. And it was literally in his last week. Mm 
And I walked in, and he was in a room right off the entrance. I, and he said, oh, hi, who are you? Shook hands. I said, take a look at this. And he had a reserpinized rat on the laboratory bench who was sort of looking like this, was shaking and tremulous and couldn't generate a gait. And he said, this rat got reserpine. It's amazing, you know, it depletes dopamine. I said, I know, I heard that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he said, watch this. And he gave the animal levodopa. And I don't remember if he injected it or passed it through a, a tube into the stomach. And a little while later, I don't remember how long later, the rat was cured. So this was a great animal model for sure, which was known about. Um, so that was like a, a brief encounter along the way. Um, so many, many of those early movement disorder people went through David's yeah. uh, lab and clinic as part of their training. So. Yeah, Roger was his first fellow as a sabbatical. I was the second fellow, mm -hmm. uh, but the first one to come right after a residency. And then many, 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 many others followed. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was a great experience. I came back to BU, and I spent about five years there full time. Um, mainly teaching, lecturing, and uh, don't worry, I think I wrote a couple of grants. I wrote a Huntington's disease grant, uh, which wasn't funded, and um, really didn't contribute a lot, but I became the movement of sort of guru in the department, where as I said before, when I was a resident, there wasn't anybody, because there weren't a lot of people doing what we now do, and we take for granted. Um, and then I took a job at the New England Deaconess Hospital at that time doing electromyography. They needed an EMG person because they are allied with the Jocelyn Clinic and they were seeing hordes of patients with peripheral neuropathy and nobody was doing nerve conduction studies. So I thought this might be an interesting move and I decided to go over there. I, uh, Simeon Locke was a well-known uh, clinical neurologist in the area, very, very smart man. And he was there and then I was there. There was the two of us. And uh, then a couple years later, I decided to go into private practice part-time. Uh, it was really to generate funds for myself. Um, and uh, I had a couple of kids that were eventually going to go to college, and I was already seeing the future and, and all of that. I had three sons by that time. And uh, went to work in a local community hospital. and. I sort of forgotten the advice that Clark Rant gave to me at NYU about be careful about private practice neurology. It's really not geared to be satisfying in that way. Uh, and I vaguely remembered it, but I did it, and I confirmed what he said to me. I really didn't have fun doing it. Uh, I liked seeing patients early in their symptoms, and I found that whatever I saw them for, whether it was migraine or a seizure disorder, the one thing about private practice is if I'm the first one seeing the patient, you actually learn something. I remember diagnosing temporal arteritis a few times. That was good, but I had no one else there to talk to about the cases. And you know how neurologists like to gab about what they do to other colleagues and pick their brain, whatever. Um, so I did that actually for 11 years. Um, and then around in, 19, in the early 1990, uh, I stopped doing that. And I went full time at the Deaconess. Uh, and I set up a movement disorder clinic. We had some donor funding. We actually carved out some space in the hospital, and I started doing much more movement disorders. I did my first clinical trial there, which, believe it or not, was resagiline. And it was a study that was not published until many years later. Matt Stern was the chief, he was the PI on the study, and there were about 10 other authors. And it, years later, we published it, and we found the same results everyone else did. But it was my first experience with clinical trials. We hired, out of the funding, my first uh, nurse coordinator. And then a couple of years after that, uh, my hospital, the Deaconess and Beth Israel Hospital, decided to merge. They're right across the street from each other. And it was merger mania in general in the U.S. Mm -hmm. at that time. And it was a difficult merger, but the, for me, it was all positive. The Beth Israel, for all of its staff, had a large staff in neurology. The only person seeing Parkinson's disease was Cliff Saper. Cliff Saper uh, was the chair, and he enjoyed Parkinson's disease. And he had some interest in the neuroanatomy because that's he basically was a neuroanatomist. He was editor of a neuroanatomy journal. And um, so I, he invited me to come over, and within a very short time, that's all I did. I 
didn't see general neurology outpatients. So I was fortunate to be able to do just what I like to do. I did inpatient neurology and did my time on the wards, but outpatient was only movement disorders. And that was very useful in propelling things forward. And the other thing that happened at that time, it's amazing how things converge, is as you remember, botulinum toxin as a therapeutic became available for patients in 19, December of 1989. Mm -hmm. And I injected my first patients in 90. I wasn't involved in any of the clinical trials because they were done other places, mainly Columbia. And I started injecting patients. I took a one-day course at Columbia sitting in an amphitheater. And the, I was actually in the back row. I got there late. I was in the back row. And they're down in the pit, Mitchell Brin. And I think I was there. Were you there? I think so, yeah. Well, were you not amazed that Mitchell Brin injected spasmodic Aubrey. dysphonia patients mm -hmm. in an auditorium? Mm -hmm. I said, this is crazy. But it was safe, and they did have video, so you could see close up what they were doing in the neck. And I went back, and I started, and you learn as you do. And I, I don't know if I did much good for my first few patients. I've had some challenges. And I, What was your first patient? Do you remember? I don't know the very first, but in that first month or two, a lab tech injured herself in the hospital. She was a hospital employee and she injured her foot. She tripped over something in the lab, and she developed one of these horrific peripheral, if you allow, mm -hmm. if you believe in that, peripheral post-traumatic movement disorder, meaning a movement disorder at least precipitated by a peripheral injury to not her brain but to her leg. And she then proceeded to develop inversion dystonia of her leg, her foot, and then her proximal muscles, and eventually her arm. And there have been cases like that published, and no one understands what they are, and some people think they're have dismissed them. Mm -hmm. um, you wrote a paper, though, comparing peripheral yeah. dystonia to idiopathic dystonia. Yeah, I did. It was, uh, it was a group of patients that I happened to see, uh, some of them referred by lawyers, who had cervical, who had torticollis mm -hmm. consequent to a head or neck injury, uh, in which in every single, there were nine cases in the series, um, every single patient had either workers' comp interests in the case or litigation interests in the case. And by the time I saw them all, they were about two years into it, and they were fixed. They were non-responsive to botulinum toxin. And um, I don't think I helped them at all, but I read, they, they were very stereotypical. I remember I published three photographs in the paper. They all looked alike. Their shoulder was up, their head mm -hmm. was down, their trapezius was severely involved, their levator scapula was involved. and I, they were they, fixed, right? They were fixed. This was not, a, I, I emphasized, it wasn't a movement disorder. It was a posture disorder. Mm -hmm. And movement disorders are often posture disorders. Mm -hmm. um, so I did that and um, did a lot with Botox. And then the first meeting of the Movement Disorder Society, appropriate since we're here this week, um, was in Washington. I didn't go. It was 1990, and I was a newbie in the field. 92 was in Munich. I went to the first one. I've been to every one since. Every one since, except I didn't go to Sydney two years ago the first, because I'd been in Sydney. I didn't want to travel. Um, and that was amazingly propelling. And, you know, if I wanted to give anyone advice about this field, is sign up as early as you can and start going to meetings, because you'll have a wealth of data. I'd push our fellows to go for sure. Um, but even we've had a couple of residents. One This week, one of our residents will be a fellow with us a year from now is here because she has a poster. So we try to get them, you know, try to snatch them away from epilepsy and neuromuscular as soon as we can, and sometimes we're able to do that. And then the Movement Disorder Society was incredibly important. I, for some reason, I was nominated to be an officer quite a while into, uh, quite a while ago, and I don't know why, because I had not been on any committees. I will reveal now. Uh, but I showed up one day, and I was the treasurer. And the way it works there is you are, tre you are treasurer-elect for two years, and then you're treasurer for two years. Uh, the president gets to be past chair, but treasurer, you were out. So I spent four years on the board and picked a, up a lot of useful experience on how that whole thing worked, how the congresses were organized. It was a very valuable experience. And... Uh, so while you're talking about that, the role of the society now and, you know, the movement disorder community, how, how would you summarize that after? What, well, one thing I 
appreciate is when they changed the name from the International Movement Disorder Society a few years ago to the International Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Society, I thought that was useful because we all discovered that people didn't understand what movement disorders meant. Mm -hmm. And then if you're sitting at a cocktail party with someone, they asked you what you did, you had to go into this a lot. You know, you know Parkinson's disease? Yeah, I know. Okay, that's what we do. If I got this, if I, I wouldn't even mention dystonia because they would look at you with a blank stare if they were not a physician. Even physicians don't know. Mm -hmm. So uh, I like that they, Parkinson's came into that. Uh, we're still struggling to get dystonia known to the world. It's still a kind of an orphan disorder, unfortunately, uh, although very treatable. Uh, but Parkinson's attracts all the attention because a lot of the breakthrough discoveries over the years, many of them uh, propelled, as I said, by activities in the Movement Disorder Society have been in the field of Parkinson's disease. Hopefully it'll happen in dystonia as well. So, so it sounds like the society had a very positive impact on your career. Enormous, absolutely enormous. I mean, I, I, as I said, I went to Munich, and then I, in Munich I presented three posters, uh, and I, I said, this is great stuff. And I remember David Marsden came by, and since we knew each other, and we'd seen each other a couple times since I was with him, came by, and he just sat there and really attentively listened to what I said about the posters, and it was, it was quite nice to do that. Uh, the other thing, then, with this new movement disorder center at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, which is now known as, we started a fellowship program, somehow scratched together the funds to pay them or had them generate their own revenue to provide salaries because there was no organized system, and there still isn't for, for generating salaries for these people when you have to get donor money or sometimes industry money. Uh, and over the years, I counted them up last night uh, so I could tell you, we've had 15 fellows. It's a one-year clinical fellowship. And of the 15 fellows, um, um, I forgot the, I think it was nine. Nine of them are now in academic slash teaching hospital positions, That's also great. propelling the field forward, which is nice to know. And then in addition, I had at least, I don't know the exact number, at least six residents who were in my clinic with me seeing patients. I never had a residents shadow me. I, did, I never liked the idea of them sitting and watching me work. They, they had to see new patients, and then they would present the cases, and they would see follow-ups, too, and present those cases. And uh, uh, there are six of those residents. There were many over the years, because we'd have four to six a year multiplied by 15 years. It's, you know, 100 of them. At least six, and I'm probably off, it may be more, have actually gone into movement disorders that, and didn't train elsewhere. And the names would be known to you, but they've trained in good places. They've we tried to get them to stay, but a couple of them went to Tony and other places that were very, very good. Um, so that's, that's been very, very nice to be able to do that. And the other thing, just to cap it off in terms of what I do now, is I got very attached to the concept of following patients with long-term disorders, because that's what we do. We both do that. Parkinson's, dystonia, tremor. Once they're your patient, they're your patient forever. And <clears throat> so I got very interested in patient education. And we have developed, I, I think I'm pretty, I'm very happy about a very multifaceted educational program. We have an annual symposium, which is available online on video on our website, in which every year we have a topic or a theme. And we stress the most common theme has been new and future therapies. But we've had themes on non-motor Parkinsonism. Uh, alternative therapies in Parkinson's to educate people about them. You know, if you want to do acupuncture, you should know a little bit about it. And we would present it in a fair way, I think. Um, the one we're doing this year is a new one. Uh, it's about Parkinson's disease in the media, how to read about it, how to listen to it, and how to watch it in an effective way. Because patients come in, you know, I got this clipping. They're sort of a little embarrassed, but not too embarrassed. What do you think of this, Doc? And some, you know, usually I've seen it or I know about it, and occasionally it's something I didn't know about or hadn't heard about. It. And then some of these articles are written in a way that's a little bit, you know, first thing is if it's in a mouse, you need to caution the patient that it may take 15 years before it gets to the clinic, and 90% of these early animal studies never go anywhere. Um, and then education about unsupported claims made by manufacturers that get into the press for the purpose, quite frankly, I don't know if I should say this on video, but for, the, for boosting their stock mm -hmm. profile. 
Uh, and so we want to say that if we can. That's going to be a little touchy to uh, say in a big group, but we'll figure out a way to do it. Uh, the, and the, finally, the last thing uh, is that we got very involved with patient wellness programs. I have a couple of people I work with. One is a social worker who are incredibly motivated and have really pointed out to me, and I was a little resistant in the beginning, skeptical maybe, that doing dance therapy, Zumba dance therapy, which is Latin music, which really gets people moving, um, um, yoga, which was already well established, um, tai, chi. tai Chi, which we don't, and a few of these things we've, we've studied, we've published on singing and improvement of voice. Turned out it didn't work very well. I think we didn't do it intensively enough. And at this meeting, one of my colleagues is presenting a study on comparing dance, once a week dance for eight weeks plus homework with standard methods of improving balance using the Berg balance scale. And PTs know how to do teaching balance or conventional ways. And the outcome I thought was rather interesting. I was disappointed that it turned out the early data was there was no difference. But uh, Veronique Vanderhorst, who was a very smart uh, basic science person, and I, she was interested in exercise and gait, so I got her to do this study. And she said, no, no, this is good information. It turned out that both the people doing conventional physical therapy and the folks doing dance both improved approximately equally, okay. which meant Take, you pays your money and you takes your choice. You can do either one, but you know what? Dance might be a lot more fun and you might actually go more and PT might be a drag. Mm -hmm. So if you can even establish that these things are equivalent, not in, as to use the parlance, non-inferior, then it's useful. So I thought that was, that was a right, I learned something from that. That's why uh, I always tell my patients when they say what kind of exercise, I say do what you like. Exactly. That's why you'll do it. Yeah. So I, I just have a couple more questions. One thing you didn't mention in your career development time was in the mid-90s, you became very involved with deep brain stimulation. Yes. You even published one of the early books on that. And can you say a little something well, about that? Thank you, right, I appreciate you reminding me. I, we had the opportunity, we had a surgeon at the, this was the deaconess now, pre-Beth Israel, who did, um, he treated spasticity with dorsal column stimulators, so he was in touch with Medtronic. And Medtronic said, we're looking for sites for DBS for tremor. It was just tremor, but it could be Parkinson tremor as well as a central tremor. And so his name was Thor Norgard. He came to me and said, would you be, he knew I did Parkinson's and tremor. He said, would you be interested? I said, sounds great. I didn't know much about it. I went to the investigators meeting in Minneapolis where Medtronic is, and we then participated in a trial that was published in the Annals of Neurology in 97, and it was unequivocal that uh, this benefited tremor dramatically. Um, and then Parkinson's came along later. Parkinson's disease, mainly through the work, uh, as you know, Ali and Benabed um, pioneered all of this stuff. And um, uh, we started doing that, and then a few years later, dystonia. And we, we were the first uh, DBS center in New England. Uh, and, uh, and then botulinum toxin also, very similarly, uh, when I mentioned we got into this in 1990, we were the first neurologic center for administering botulinum toxin. There was a fellow, a pioneer in the field, Gary Barodic, who was at the Mass Eye and Ear as a neuro-ophthalmologist, and he was treating blepharospasm and hemifacial spasm. And I remember going over and watching him. And the way he did it was he would put a little plastic cup over the globe to protect the eyeball as he was inserting needles into the eyelids. And I took a look at that, and I said, oh, I don't know if I want to do that. It <laughs> looks a little touchy to me. So I actually put it aside. And he was showing this to me in the 80s, because the clinical trials, you remember, were very, all through the 80s. It took a long time before they got approval. Right. And I put it aside, and then I came back to it when I realized there are other indications besides blepharospasm, so you know, cervical dystonia especially. It was unclear how useful it was going to be in those early days to those of us who weren't using it. Right yeah, now. and there were a lot of critics who said, nah, They'll get tolerant to the stuff, it won't work. Or with cervical dystonia, remember the argument was, the brain will outwit you. It'll find, other, you know, there's so many muscles that rotate the head mm -hmm. that other muscles will come into play and you'll be chasing muscles. Because the surgical experience was like that. They would mm -hmm. cut a couple of muscles or cut a nerve and then it would come back because other muscles took over the function of the denervated muscle. So, so let me close with two questions. One is, besides neurology, what do you like? 
to do what, and I know one of your passions is the Boston Red Sox. Right. So maybe take a minute and say something about that. Well, this year the Red Sox are testing my passion. <laughs> uh, not doing so well. Well, I do, I, my kids, the night, I managed to. They blew an eight run lead. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> um, the, uh, I share with my three sons a passion for spectator sports, mm -hmm. and so I've inculcated them. And even though two of my three sons don't live in Boston anymore, they're near, you know, one's in New York, one's in Connecticut, and uh, they're still passionate about their Red Sox. And my oldest son has three grandchildren, and they're equally passionate about the Red Sox. We go to games together. Mm -hmm. We text each other during the playoffs, and it's fun. The other thing I got interested in a few years ago is I do sculpture. I do clay and wax sculpture. And my, I found that I do mainly figures, both animal but mostly human figures. And knowing muscle anatomy, I, I did EMG for several years once upon a time. Muscle anatomy helps. I know what muscles are supposed to look like. And I spend a half a day a week at the um, Fine Arts Museum in Boston where they have courses and uh, have a great teacher and I've actually uh, cast a few things. He's taken them to his uh, foundry and he's casted them and they're now littering various parts of my house and <laughs> one piece has actually made it into the living room. That's great. Um, that was, I, I passed that hurdle and so we'll see what uh, what goes with that. Uh, and then the last thing is what advice would you give for a young person coming through now interested in movement disorders? Um, I would say uh, join the Movement Disorder Society as soon as you can, as I said earlier, and get exposed to other people in the field. Um, I think maybe make a decision as to whether you want to do clinical research or laboratory research, although it's possible to do both, but it's increasingly difficult to make that combination and that traditional tripod of clinical care research and teaching is still possible, and that's kind of what I've done over the years. But as you know, it's very hard to balance that, and the demands on you to generate funds and write grants are great. And so the risk is you may not be really good at any one of those things. You'll be pretty good in most of them. Uh, so I think maybe focus early, take a fellowship that if you want to be in the lab and get a taste of that, take a fellowship that offers a laboratory experience. Many of the fellowships now are two or even three years, and you can spend the first year learning clinical movement disorders and then plan on what you want to do in year two or even year three. Uh, we just offer the one-year clinical, and the folks that we've trained have largely gone into, if they've gone into research, it's been, in, I think, without exception, clinical research. No one's doing bench work. Mm -hmm. So I would say the MDS is really the way to go to, uh, and talk to people. I, I was so fortunate to have these mentors. Uh, sometimes you have to seek them out. They're busy, so you've got to find them and take advantage. They're pretty accepting when you do come to them. I think the senior yeah. people have always been there. Often more so yeah. than you expected. A yeah. lot of that is you wor people worry about that. Mm -hmm. They feel shy. A meeting like this, you can go up to somebody, maybe right after they gave a talk and run up to them right before they come down and engage them. And, mm -hmm. you know, we are all, you know, here the pressures are off. You're at a meeting, you're in a nice city, having good food. And so everyone is very giving, I mm -hmm. find here. Um, so take advantage. Thanks, Dave. Thank you very, very much.